Hi, welcome to another video in this series on the Raspberry Pi. This is the fourth episode of the series. In the previous videos, we learnt about the RPI boards, their history, how to set them up for use and learn about the usage of GPIO on the RPI using the SysFS interface. In this episode, we talk about using the SPI on Raspberry Pi using the C language. Now there are multiple ways to do so in C as well. Today we see how to use SPI using the SPIDEV framework in C. Let's go. We previously saw the feature rich 40 pin connector of the Raspberry Pi. This is the mapping of the I.O. pins which are brought out on the connector. You have primarily three broad categories of I.O. Power, Communication and Sound. All the pins other than power can be used as general purpose I.O. as well. You have the SPI, I2C and UART which are very commonly used in embedded systems. You also have a couple of PWM pins which can be used to drive motors or some other actuators. Unfortunately, as of today, the Raspberry Pi boards don't have a hardware ADC on them, but the Raspberry Pi Pico changes that. Before we actually see how to use this SPI bus, let us first learn a little bit about it. It basically has two main players, the SPI master and the SPI slave. In a typical SPI implementation, you would see four connections. The clock is generated by the SPI master. This is the heartbeat of the communication. The second signal is the MOSI or the master out slave in. This is the line that carries data from the master to the slave. The third connection is the MISO or master in slave out. This is the line that carries data from the slave to the master. The fourth line is called the chip select. Unless and until the chip select has been asserted, that is pulled low, the slave should not respond to the master. For example, if you have an SPI system that has two slaves, only the one whose chip select line has been pulled low shall respond to the master. One of the best features of this bus is that full duplex communication is possible using this bus. That is, the master and slave can exchange data at the same time. Another important feature is that due to the chip select mechanism, multiple slaves can be connected to the same master, but only one slave can and should always talk to the master. Typical SPI masters and systems are microcontrollers, microprocessors, FPGAs, etc. Typical SPI slaves that we see in systems are displays, sensors, secure elements, memories, and so on. With this info with us, let us look at how the SPI bus can be used in the Raspberry Pi world. These are some of the more popular ways of using the SPI in the Raspberry Pi. There are two ways in which you can use the SPI bus, using C or C++ or Python. If using C or C++, there are two main paths that can be chosen. First path is that you can write a Linux driver that will execute within the Linux kernel. This has several advantages like faster execution, higher priority, tight coupling with the kernel and so on. However, this is the more difficult way to use the SPI bus and has a higher learning curve than the other method which is to use a framework called SPIDEV in the user space. It has its own advantages and is pretty popular among beginners as well as intermediates and experts for certain applications. If using Python, then using SPIDEV is the best option to go with. In fact, a lot of freely available Python modules use C or C++ based implementations in the background to efficiently use the SPIDEV framework. As is true with almost all Python implementations, the learning curve for such a method is pretty low and heavy abstraction allows you to talk to your SPI slave within a few lines of code. In today's video, we will talk about the SPI usage in Raspberry Pi and any other Linux system for that matter using the SPIDEV framework. But first, let us understand what the SPIDEV is. The SPIDEV is a way 
to use the SPI or SPI in the user space, it uses the SPI kernel driver and allows you to use the SPI master in your system as a device. SPIDEV is pretty handy to get started fast and is often also used in the final implementation of a lot of systems around us. It is important to know that the Linux kernel supports SPI in master mode only. Remember, not everything needs a kernel driver. The most important thing to know about SPIDEV is that it supports implementation in master mode only. Another thing to know is that the SPIDEV allows you to use the SPI slave as a device. This means that the SPI device is available in the dev folder with the configuration parameters that can be written to or read from using simple ioctl io commands. Wait, what is ioctl? ioctl is an abbreviation for input output control. This is a system call in the Linux kernel for input output operations specific to a particular device. A system call is a way for any application to request some service from the Linux kernel. Each system call or syscall has to specify at the minimum what service it expects and for what. For example, we just saw that the SpyDev is a device available for use in the user space. By firing ioctl calls with SPI specific parameters, changes to the Spy device and operations with the device can be done. These SPI specific parameters are also called request codes and these are unique for each device. For example, the request codes for SPI will be different from that of I2C. The request code is generally a macro defined in the appropriate header file for that device. Now let us look at a bare minimum SPI dev application. Say you have an application that uses SPI dev in the user space and a SPI dev driver running within the Linux kernel. What would their exchanges look like? The first step is to open the SPI dev device. Remember how we saw that the dev folder has SPI dev entries that look like SPI dev x.y? These have to be opened using file IO operations, for example, an open or an fopen function call. The next step is to configure the SPI bus using ioctl calls. The configuration may involve setting the clock speed, configuring the SPI operation mode, etc. The status of this operation is returned by the kernel to the application. If successful, the application will then send the appropriate data and receive the appropriate data. The status for each of these operations is received by the application and can be used to decide the next step. The request code for SPI configuration, SPI transmit and receive etc. are all unique. Come, let us test this flow in a quick loopback test. In this loopback test, we loop back our data, that is, we try to receive what we send out. This is done by physically connecting the MOSI and the MISO lines of the Raspberry Pi I.O. connector. For instance, in this case, we simply connect the pins 19 and 21 of the Raspberry Pi I.O. connector. Remember, the pin 19 is MOSI and the pin 21 is MISO. Let's look at the loopback script that we have written. It's a very basic SPI script. We have defined the SPI device as slash dev slash pi dev 0.0. .0 because the SPI bus is 0 and the chip select that we have used is also 0. We use a structure of the type SPI IOC transfer. This is available in the SPI dev framework. In this, we tell it that we want to transfer an array of the size 32. We populate that array as the numbers 0 to 31. Then we try to open the device, we try to set its mode and once we are satisfied, we try to set the bus speed. When we are satisfied with the bus speed, we try to perform the transmit operation and then print the received SPI buffer. Let's take a look at this in action. Let's try first to run the loopback without the two pins connected. So now we don't have the MOSI and MISO connected. When we run the loopback, we receive nothing because it's all zeros. We have not connected the lines. Now let's connect both the lines. Let's try to run the loopback again. 
This time we have received the entire buffer that we sent. This tells us that the loopback works. Let's go back to the video. Alright, the loopback worked. Let us now do something more fun. Let us now try to drive an OLED display using the SPI interface. The OLED display that we will use today is named UG2832 HSWE G04. It is manufactured by a company called Univision Technology in Taiwan. The link to the datasheet of this display is in the description. What is more important to know is that the display controller inside this module is the SSD1306 from Solomon Sestec. The link to the datasheet of this controller is also in the description. All you need to know is that the display controller is an SPI slave that we will send messages to from the Raspberry Pi. This display controller will understand the SPI messages and do the needful. For example, it will initialize and clear the display, turn it on, turn it off and so on. This display is a 128 by 32 display. The board that we will use also has several push buttons and LEDs on this to allow one to make a nice little demo. This board is from Microchip Technology. The link to the documentation of this board is also in the description and the link to purchase this one is also found in the description. These are the connections that we will be doing for this example. We will be connecting the SPI pins that is clock, MISO, MOSI and chip select that is the CE0 on the Raspberry Pi board. Since we are using CE0 and the SPI bus on the IO connector is also SPI0, the device that we will work with in software is the slash dev slash spy dev 0.0. .0. Note, the display that we have chosen does not support any reads from the master, so we can skip connecting the MISO line. Also, note the GPIO connections to the display, that is the command and data line and the reset line, which is used to enable the display. The link to the code and the process to build this code is in the description. Do check it out. Come, let us implement this quickly and see SPI communication in action. Let's take a look at the software that we are going to run. The first file is called the OLED underscore demo dot C. This contains the main function and it's pretty small. It prints a string that says welcome to the OLED demo. Then it performs the configuration of the GPIO and the SPI for display. The GPIO that we are using is for the data command line and for the reset line that is connected to the display. Then we configure the SPI bus. In this case, we configure the SPI bus speed and the mode of operation. Once done, we initialize the display within which we actually turn off the display, we reset it, we do various configurations that are needed for the display to work correctly and after that, we simply start printing strings on the display. All the relevant functions for configuring the GPIO, for configuring the SPI bus and for configuring the display are present inside the file called OLED underscore functions dot C. All of this code is available at GitHub in our repository. Please refer to the description of this video for the link to it. Now let us run this code. All we do is run the OLED underscore demo application with sudo permission so that it can access the device files. As you can see, the printing has now started. If you look closely, we are printing a string every 500 milliseconds. That's it for the demo. That's it. That is the end of this video. Thank you for tuning in and do leave a comment and a like if you enjoyed this and would like more content like this. See you soon with a brand new video about the world's favorite computer. Bye.